Their own intelligence community has assessed that the Afghan government will likely collapse. That is not true. The first big city to fall was Kunduz, one after another. Afghanistan's biggest cities outside of Kabul were captured, Herat to the west. Terrorists in Kabul carrying out the deadliest attack on U.S. troops in over a decade. Afghanistan is lost. Move it! Freedom came under attack. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes. At my direction, a small team of Americans carried out the operation with extraordinary courage. They killed Osama bin Laden. Al-Baghdadi is dead. It's time to end America's longest war. We'll do it responsibly. Rushing to the airport, behind them, the sound of gunfire. Deliberately. Countless Afghans who helped American troops were left behind. And safely. Afghans by the thousands desperate to escape life under the Taliban. Today I'm speaking with former U.S. Secretary of State and CIA Director Mike Pompeo. Secretary Pompeo also served four terms in Congress, representing Kansas' 4th District, where he sat on the House Intelligence Committee as well as the Energy and Commerce Committee and the House Select Benghazi Committee. Pompeo graduated first in his class at the United States Military Academy at West Point and served five years in the U.S. Army. Secretary Pompeo is currently the Senior Counsel for Global Affairs at the ACLJ and possesses unparalleled experience regarding U.S. foreign policy, including dealing with Afghanistan. It's September 7th, 2021, and we are joined by Secretary Mike Pompeo, who is gonna talk a bit about not only his role in the previous administration, but also you know, looking back on the history of Afghanistan and the Taliban and, and sort of what's unfolded in the last few weeks. Uh, and, but Secretary Pompeo, I wanna want actually go a little bit further back. Uh, we're right around the corner. It's just this weekend when we're recording this for the 20th you know, anniversary of September 11th, the September 11th attacks, 2001. You kind of can compare that timeline very similarly to where President Bush came into office you know, eight or nine months into his presidency. Uh, September 11th attack happened. You can see that there was a big, uh, it was a uniting moment for a lot of people, for Americans, a lot of people united around President Bush, uh, united around what ended up becoming the war on terror. Uh, Comparing that to now, you have President Biden roughly around the same time uh, of his administration having this kind of uh, response from the American people. Uh, I just wanted to get your read on that and sort of your feelings on kind of the juxtaposition of, of this 20 year uh, you know, battle. You know, it's really remarkable to, to put it in that context. I, I remember so well as does everyone else what they were doing that day. We remember watching President Bush go to the rubble of the towers demand vengeance, justice, appropriately so. A strong America prepared to go defend its interests when they were attacked. And today to see an administration that's doing precisely the opposite, right? We had 13 Americans killed. Uh, we had American interests in terms of equipment on the ground. We had uh, Americans who had supported us in Afghanistan, each of those things we've now walked away from. So it just the converse of what had taken place that day. We can all talk, and I'm sure we will, about the intervening 20 years but the contrast between the strength of America that day at one of our worst moments and the weakness of America today now demonstrated on the global stage at a moment where we had the ability to dictate terms is really quite jarring. You look back on that, uh, the September 11th attack and everything that happened, like I said, you remember where you were? We all remember where we were at that point. I believe you were a private citizen along with a lot of people. A lot of the people though that are involved in government now or in government then uh, can have this sort of a uh, different perspective and a different point of view on how things run. Um, but for you, looking at the war on terror as a whole, do you think that the initiation of it, that it was the right decision? Looking back, I'm just curious of your thoughts, because I know historically we can obviously look back and say, well, there was miscalculations, missteps, clearly along the way, everyone makes mistakes. But do you feel the initial uh, reasoning was there, still now looking back on it 20 years? The theory of the case that uh, America failed to protect itself from this attack uh, that emanated from Osama bin Laden and his crew in Afghanistan. That, that was an that was an American failure to protect 
American interest. We needed to make sure that we did uh, all, all the right, appropriate things to respond to that and protect. We've actually built out a very capable, we collectively, the American people, the military, the intelligence community, have built out a very effective counterterrorism set of operations around the world. I can't tell you, as CIA director, I, I literally can't tell you how many times I saw plots disrupted around the world by really effective multilateral counterterrorism efforts. So I, I think that was precisely the right response. Uh, when we move away from that, when we get to the bigger objectives to try and bring a democratic Afghanistan or the same notion in Iraq that said, no, we're going to fundamentally transform the culture and the people of those places. That's an awful lot of hubris and something that America has demonstrated now at least twice, I would argue more, is probably beyond the can of our military to execute. And we ought to be very cautious at risking American lives in an effort to do just those things. You brought up that um, specific instance where there was maybe some intelligence uh, issues. We had the intelligence, or how many times that that we were warned that attack could come, even post 9-11, because of all the precautions that were put in place, and those were thwarted, those were taken care of. You had a similar situation, I feel like, in Afghanistan over the last couple of weeks. Obviously, you said many of our service people and hundreds of, of Afghan people uh, died. We had the warning. The warning got played on television around the world. But for some reason this time, it didn't thwart the attack. It didn't stop the attack. So the intelligence was there but not the ability to do anything about it. Yeah, it may just, it, that, that's certainly one plausible explanation. There were other times that we could, that, that I was aware of, we, we could see threats. We, we knew that they were, that someone was working on something somewhere, but we didn't know who, and we didn't know exactly where. And so we were scrambling, using every tool that we had to find it. We, we weren't always successful at finding it. Perhaps they just weren't able to do that here yeah. as well. There is a second piece to this that does matter, though. With with even really good intelligence, you have to have the resources and the determination to push back against them. You have to be serious and thoughtful. And when you make a promise that you're going to do something, you 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 darn well better deliver on that promise, uh, or die trying. Right? Give everything you have to achieve that end. I don't believe that the Biden administration, particularly President Biden himself was prepared to follow through on the commitments, the promises he made about getting Americans out, protecting American lives. He just didn't demonstrate the resolve yeah. to do that. Instead, he chose a political arbitrary departure date, and you can see what's befallen us as a result of that. But a lot of people, and I'm sure you've heard this now countless times, including President Biden himself, has uh, shifted blame to the Trump administration, has, has seemed to say, oh, well, this was their plan. We just were following through with it. Before we discuss that part, what would have been the big difference between what you had in place, uh, what President Trump had in place, and then what this chaotic exit that happened? Was it inevitable that it would be like this, or was there things that could have been done and were planning on being done? Yeah, I don't have to guess about this. <laughs> I, I could demonstrate it over four years, precisely what we did and how different it was from the way the Biden administration approached it. Uh, our, our resolve was to make sure that we got our young kids home just as quickly as we could. President Trump campaigned on this. It was a big promise that he had made. And we worked diligently on it. We got you know, 15,000 to fewer than 3,000 forces remaining on the ground. We still had a, uh, a significant intelligence capability there as well. And while we did that, each step along the way, from 15,000 to 8,600 on down, um, we paused, we made sure that conditions were right. We worked with the Afghan leadership. We worked with women's groups and NGOs. We worked with the Taliban, every Afghan interest, trying to deliver the conditions to ultimately get our forces free. But we knew, and President Trump was very clear to me and to the Department of Defense as well, conditions have to be right before we can, we can do this. And on January 20th of 2021, when we departed, we had what passes for stability in Afghanistan. We had months and months and months where no American was attacked, let alone any American killed. And we had a deterrence model that convinced the Taliban that they weren't going to go after American or American interests. Uh, th those are facts. No one can dispute those. And uh, others can spin stories about what we would, would have done. But I can only say this. I only wish that the Biden administration had followed through on what the Trump administration's plan was. You talked about working with everybody, including the Taliban. Uh, we're talking, obviously, a lot about them in this uh, this documentary. But specifically on your policy, you had you know, President Biden, as you just said, trying to, to almost blame uh, your policies and the Trump policies as a bad thing by saying you know, 
that there was an agreement to not attack and kill any Americans uh, with the Taliban that you had done. Why was that a bad thing? I mean, you look at it sort of on the, the grander scale, if we knew what was going to happen and, and sadly, I mean, you're the only person I know probably who sat down and met with the Taliban. But when you look at it like that and it's positioned this way to the American people, well, don't you think people are going to go, well, then clearly when now there's you know multiple people dead, multiple servicemen, plus obviously uh, hundreds of Afghan people, but you had that time of relative peace. Uh, why do you think and how can they even make that into an, an argument that this was a bad plan when, like you said, there was months and months and months without any bloodshed. Their attempt at blame shifting has been pretty feeble, frankly, and frankly, a, a misfocus too. They should be focused on the things that matter while there's still a, a real challenge going on instead of trying to rewrite history in the moment. Um, I, I don't want to rewrite history. I just want people to reflect on the work that we did. Uh, we, we not only had a set of agreements with the uh, Taliban and the Afghan government, uh, but we had a deterrence model that was established. We had set out a set of red lines for the Taliban. We said, if you do X, Y, or Z, there'll be real costs to pay. In a couple of cases they did, or they got close to doing that, and we did. We rained American power on them. Uh, we the, the reason that we weren't attacked might well be the grace of God, but it is also most certainly the case that they feared that America was gonna bring all of its wrath on them if they did. And I think once President Biden made the call and said, we're, we're out, here's the date certain, force the military to close Bagram by not providing the resources to keep it open. I think those things signaled combined with when they were pushed on, when the Taliban pushed against the Biden administration, they withdrew. And instead of what we did when they pushed on us, we just crushed them. Yeah. Uh, I think I think those I think those were the things that sort of flipped the script and created the chaotic situation that we have today. That's why I'm convinced uh, that the model that we had for four years was a sustainable model that was going to ultimately deliver the ultimate outcome that the president had deigned, the, deigned, told the American people he would have achieved. And we could have done so in a way that would have delivered a much better outcome for the United States of America. So you, you have that situation. So where do we go from here, do you think, as Americans, Americans are compassionate people, they see the imagery, they see what's happening, uh, and they feel a little lost. But you also have, where do we go from here? Not only where we you would take have taken us, but what, what do you think happens? I mean, it's hard to forecast when a lot of people are watching this. They, they could be watching this a decade from now. But for you, you know, what's some proactive things that people can do? What, what, what can they even do to, to feel more than helpless, which is what it kind of feels like at this point? So I'll give three ideas. First, uh, any, to, to anyone who's served in Afghanistan, uh, civilians who served there as diplomats, intelligence warriors, Marines, sailors, soldiers, airmen, Please take pride in the work that you did. I saw it firsthand. I saw the lives that were saved, the American lives were saved by our ability to disrupt terror plots, not only in Afghanistan, but throughout the world. Uh, know that your service was noble, it was important, it was powerful, and that America thanks you for that. So I think that's something that's been lost in this moment as well. Uh, second, the Biden administration has the capacity to make better a very desperate situation. It begins with the same, using the same clarity that we did in the Trump administration. You cannot beg the Taliban. You cannot bribe the Taliban. You must convince the Taliban that their life will become very difficult if they don't do the things that America needs to do to not only get its people out and all those folks, all the U.S. persons that are in Afghanistan today, but anything that they might do that will enable Al Qaeda or ISIS or any other radical Islamist terrorists in that space to threaten or harm America or American interests in the world. And you have to set up a set of tools that can deliver against that. We were convinced that we had a model that would do it. Finally, uh, and this is stepping back one more piece, but very important. The world's now wondering whether the United States and the Biden administration will live up to the promises it's made to them. Our adversaries are salivating at the idea that they may be able to push us around around the world and we'll simply issue press releases from the Department of State. We have to find places and tools and opportunities to demonstrate that America isn't walking off the global stage, that we are not back to the eight years of President Obama apologizing for America, but we are again an America that will put America first, that will be very realistic. We're not gonna send 20, 40, 60, 80,000 soldiers to fight and die someplace because we don't need to. When Qasem Soleimani threatened Americans, we didn't put a tank division into Iran, we put a Hellfire missile on his vehicle, right? We, we, we demonstrated American technology and capacity and resolve 
in a way that sent a clear signal to the world that America wasn't going to stand for being pushed around. I hope the Biden administration will find places and opportunities to demonstrate that resolve to restore the credibility that America had built out up over not just the, the four years we were there, but for a couple of hundred years as well. But not only credibility of our uh, adversaries, from our adversaries to, to be scared and, and to understand that people like you could could send these missiles, could destroy, could, could rain hellfire if necessary. But what about for our allies? who clearly, a lot of them in the EU and even in the UK, some extent, people were uh, thrilled to see, you know, President Biden uh, be elected. Times are changing. A lot of respect is lost there on, on the global scale from our allies. They're concerned. Look, I don't know if they should be honestly, uh, maybe giving us the only ownership of the world as they do. We're saying, you know, we have to protect, uh, you know, we don't know if we can believe that the Americans are always gonna be there for us, but, for you, how do we gain that respect back from uh, our allies, some of them very powerful, like is it like the United Kingdom, some of our strongest allies who are publicly having MPs come out and say, you know, we don't know if we can trust that American superpower is going to be the one uh, to help and back us up. There are two things I know for sure. Words won't get it done. No great speech in Brussels, no remarks that the United Nations are going to solve this credibility problem. Second, uh, actions matter. So you can, uh, you can hypothesize a number of things the administration could do, uh, right? The, the NATO folks are wondering why on earth it was uh, they were prepared to do work that we weren't prepared to do to get their folks out. We should demonstrate to them that we in fact are. Those tools are still uh, within our ken, within our power. You can imagine uh, another place, the people uh, of Taiwan. You can imagine doing things for them. How about delivering on some of the equipment that the Trump administration sold to them? Actually have it show up. Things that would demonstrate real American resolve to defend American interests around the world. It's not gonna take sending our young men and women to do that. It's just gonna take delivering against the set of promises that we've made to these friends and allies and partners. I'll give you one more. How about this? How about stop traveling to Vienna to meet with the Islamic Republic of Iran just for a moment? Uh, the Iranians have now launched missiles out of Gaza Strip into Israel on this administration's watch. You could imagine saying, well, that's just unacceptable. We are no longer going to negotiate with you. The simple things, but real deeds. And you brought up that there was a relative calm that happened. I think a lot of people forgot. And, and I tried to bring it up often whenever I was debating personally with many of my friends or even publicly on our radio broadcast saying, listen, you're all forgetting about the situation in Israel, what it was like under the Obama administration. You're all forgetting about ISIS. Like it feels like because the Trump administration was so strong and so uh, uh, defeated ISIS very quickly and rapidly, our memories are not very long and people stopped thinking about it and it didn't become a big talking point. And maybe it should have, maybe this should be something that conservatives uh, next time around are running on saying, no, remember what happened here? This is something quickly we as Americans can forget that the Middle East in crisis ends up meaning our country also gets involved and our country ends up in crisis. I hated that it, that it didn't become a bigger issue uh, even during the last election. You know, it's certainly the case that we, we all want to turn our attention to the things at home, to our churches, to our faith communities, to our schools. Right. But those are the things that affect our lives every moment. Uh, but you're absolutely right. We, we can't forget what it means if there's chaos around the world. It doesn't mean we have to police it all. It means that America needs to be out there uh, demonstrating resolve and leadership. We, we created the Abraham Accords without sending a bunch of folks into the desert to go fight and die. We created a set of uh, alliances that built out peace and stability there in the way that no one believed that we could possibly do. Those are the kind of things I hope people will remember and consider as, as we go to the ballot box and elect city council people and sheriff's offices and all that good stuff. Remember that these conservative ideas about our founding and our republic are central to the very peace and prosperity here at home that we count on. As we start to wrap up, uh, I can't help but also look to the current Secretary of State uh, who, who has stated we have shifted to a diplomatic chapter with the Taliban. Do you think that that, you've sat down with them, you've met with them, do you think that's a, a, a feasible goal, that having a diplomatic relationship? It sounds crazy coming out of my mouth. As someone who, for the last 20 years, has heard the Taliban as a terrorist organization for the last 20 years, and now say, we're going to have a diplomatic relationship with them. It's hard for Americans, hard for me, to even fathom it. But you've been there, you, you've met with them. Is that is that a, a goal? No, this is still the same Taliban that uh harbored Osama bin Laden and caused all kinds of challenges for the United States of America. Uh, they are still playing footsie with Al-Qaeda. Uh, 
they, they've, they've not turned a new leaf. This is not going to be. There's, I didn't see Thomas Jefferson sitting across the table from me or any any near replica of that. Uh, the thing they understood was power. The thing they understood was uh, the uh, resolve of someone to push back against them. That was the only thing that could shape their behavior. It, it wasn't some kind word or some demarche that we issued to them. Something that's on your heart, it's on a lot of our hearts as we're watching it, is obviously there has been 20 years of, of relative religious freedom uh, in Afghanistan for Christians. Uh, we've heard obviously lots of reports, lots of mixed messages of what's actually happening there. Uh, but we know what will probably happen and what will happen to the Christian community. And But for you, what happens to them? What is the ramifications to the growing Christian groups in Afghanistan? I pray for them. It's gonna be tough and it's gonna get worse. And I'm confident it already likely has. We, we see Kabul, that's where the TV crews are today. My guess is in places outside of Kabul, for Christians, it's already gotten much worse. I know there are Christians who are trying to get out still. I pray for them that they can make safe passage and get to safety outside of Afghanistan. The Taliban's rule is likely to be the same autocratic, uh, radical Islamist, hardcore Sharia uh, government that we saw for all of those years. It will make life for those who want to profess their faith or profess their love for Jesus Christ absolutely miserable or, or worse. Uh, I, I pray for Christians all around the world that are in these persecuted places. And I think in Afghanistan, we've only seen the beginning of how difficult this will get. It is easy to only remember the ending to this, to remember everyone leaving, to remember uh, the, the, the horrible exit that happened in Afghanistan. But we know that there have been 20 years, as you said, of people who have gone and served, for our troops that have gone and served in Afghanistan. And it's important to remind people, remind our audience that some missions were accomplished, but certainly that their loved ones' lives were not lost in vain, that people did not lose not only their lives, but mental stability, everything that comes with war, that this isn't, this wasn't something that was just completely lost. And we need to look back and not only focus and remember the last chapter of this. No, that's absolutely true. Much good work, much important work was done uh, in Afghanistan and all throughout South Central Asia and in the Middle East more broadly over the last two decades. We've protected important American interests. We've saved countless American lives. We made life better for the people of Afghanistan along the way as well. Uh, this wasn't the ending that was foreordained. That is most, most tragic, but that doesn't take away from the heroes that served there, the people who delivered the food and the meals and the equipment and who fought in hard places in hard times and it doesn't diminish the nobleness of the sacrifice that so many families made in this far off place. Well, thank you, Secretary Pompeo. I appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today.